asking us to do, and they are different uh, things that, that you believe that you want to do in your scouting position in order to evolve as a scout leader and, and help uh, certain organizations, etc. And uh, we have uh, David Smith right here, who's also a Bob White, so awesome guy. Excellent. We all agree that Bob White's on the, yeah, the, yeah, the best, the, the best of all, yes. And now, out of the five tickets, one has to be a diversity ticket, okay? Diversity could be something with minorities, it could be something with international, it could be something with uh, disabilities, it could be all sorts of different types of, uh, or, or demographics, etc. And uh, Mr. Smith is going to tell us about scouting with autism, a very, very important and sometimes frustrating issue to deal with. So thank you very much, and let's hear from you. Thanks for the introduction. My name is David Smith, and I'm here today to talk about scouting and autism. Um, I want to share my personal story with autism to begin with, which goes back to the days when I was first married and working in cash and carry as a cashier, and it can be a little boring moving those cans along through the thing. So to keep myself occupied, what I would try and do would be keep a running tally of the customer's tab in my head, and then figure out tax, take off the coupons, try and get within about 25 cents or so. Well, like anything that you do for eight hours a day, you get pretty good at it. And a bagger came up to me one day and says, that's amazing, are you autistic? <laughs> and I said, autistic? No, as a matter of fact, I don't dwell very well at all. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only joke tonight, so. It also explains my horrible charts that I have here, but quite honestly, my exposure to autism over the next 20 years was composed completely of knowing that there were 482 paper clips on the floor and Walkner is on at four o'clock. And if you guys haven't seen Rain Man, you really should see it in spite of Tom Cruise. It is a fantastic <laughs> movie, all right? So today I wanna to talk to you about, oh, for the next 20 years, until my son went to Crossover. And at Crossover, there was a scout at Crossover who challenged me to the core. Now I've been working with youth for years, and no, no youth will challenge me. I will figure them out, I, will, I love them. For the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna call that scout Sam. Because Sam made me open my eyes to autism and made me understand. So this is not about scouting and autism. This is Sam. Now, let's deal with the elephant in the room first of all. You say autism, I think about the only word that's scarier to us is cancer. Autism can be scary, right? And we have these questions, and some of these questions, I mean, immediately seem like they're not fair, but when you think about them, does this scout belong in my unit? Well, there are units out there that are specific to specific needs of scouts. So there are packs and troops and crews that deal with vision impaired or mobility impaired or autistic. However, the opinion of National BSA is mainstreaming. A scout does better in a unit with other scouts regardless of their abilities. And we all have differing abilities, right? So what we're really talking about here is a different approach to abilities. Can they succeed? Yes, absolutely they can succeed. And if you're not aware of it already, there is actually a path of alternative requirements that you can file through uh, council. So if you have a scout, for example, who's in a wheelchair and they have to do their five mile hike to be able to get to first class, you can get an, uh, a waiver in there that says they're gonna do their five miles in their wheelchair. And it's very, very straightforward process to be able to go through. Same thing applies for autistic scouts. What if, well, what if this happens with that scout? What if that happens with that scout? We get to the what if, I think the two mottos of scouting guide us best. One from Cub Scouts, do your best. And two from Boy Scouts, be prepared. If you do your best and you be prepared, what if kind of falls off the table. All this extra work for one scout, I will tell you as a father, I do not want my son to be a member of a unit whose leadership is not willing to do extra work for one scout. I will also tell you guys as leaders that I challenge you guys today to stop being volunteers and stop start being scouters. This is my saying, I hope that you steal it and pass it all around. The difference between a leader and a scouter is, uh, between a volunteer and a scouter, is that a volunteer is there to make sure that their son has a good experience. And a scouter is there to make sure that everyone's son has a good experience. Are they dangerous? Yes. 
but not because they're autistics, but because they're scouts. These are young boys running around in the woods with sharp sticks and fires and knives, and they are dangerous, but no more so than any other scout. Autism is a spectrum, and no matter how much you try to be prepared, you forget your nice black marker that you draw out your spectrum with. There are three elements to this spectrum. First is communication. Autistic scouts, by definition of their condition, have difficulty communicating, and often have difficulty communicating about emotional topics. And so that's something that we have to be prepared to work around and deal with. The next one, by the way, if you ever have to present a, a difficult presentation with flip charts, write your notes on the back. <laughs> the next part is social. Autistic scouts, by definition, have difficulties with social interaction. And it can be anything from understanding social boundaries to understanding appropriate conversation, all different components of social interaction. The next part is behavioral. And when you think of autistic and you think of behavioral, think what you think of as the kid over in the corner rocking back and forth, right? That's called self-stimming. And what it does, and I'll point you to a great resource afterwards, what it does is it actually helps to calm the scout by stimulating themselves. Once we understand that behavior, that it's calming, it becomes much, much less disruptive. But because it's a spectrum, I can't plot anywhere on here. It's not a line that I can say, okay, Johnny is here and Bobby is here and this. I have to understand how those three elements fit together. What's a leader to do? Well, first of all, parental involvement. When you have a scout who's autistic, the first thing you want to do is have a conversation with the parents. Now that sounds easy, but it may be a little harder than you think. A lot of parents don't want their scouts treated differently. So they may be hesitant to tell you, especially if there's somebody who's extremely high functioning. Leadership. You're a unit leader. Act like a unit leader. Set a good example. Set an example for your scouts integrate your autistic scouts into the rest of the troop. Respect. I was talking to our scout that we'll refer to as Sam before this, and I said, what's the number one thing that you want from your leaders and your other scouts? <clears throat> one word came out of his mouth right away, respect. Encouragement. They can be successful. They will be successful, but we need to keep pushing them to move forward. Clear, concise instructions. Uh, people who deal with autism things broken down into very simple steps. Now here's the magic of autism. If you give them very simple steps, they will repeat those very simple steps precisely. Who here would not be a better leader if we stopped to think about everything we wanted our scouts to do in very simple steps? It's good guidance for all of our scouts. And finally, supervision and discipline. Also good guidance for all of our scouts. Understanding the parental involvement will help you to be able to manage supervision and discipline. Set uh, rules up ahead of time. Write them up. Give them to your scouts. Rule consequences. We're not just talking about autism now. We're talking about running better units. It makes sense. The things that you do to make your unit easier for a autistic scout to succeed in will make your unit easier for every scout to succeed in. Working through autism. And I call this specifically working through autism because I want you to get the idea that autism is a tool that you can use to bring scouts to success. Provide predictable structure. So come out and say, hey, we've got a camp out this weekend and we're gonna be doing this first and this second, we're gonna be doing this third. Once you guys finish cleaning up your dishes from breakfast, I need everybody to assemble at the flagpole so that we can begin our hike. Predictable structure. Again, every scout benefits from that. Allow extra time. None of the requirements in Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts are time delimited. It doesn't say tie a square knot within 20 seconds. It says demonstrate that you can tie a square knot. Allow extra time for them to be able to handle the skill. Announce transitions early. I'm gonna finish up with this slide and then I'm gonna do a brief exercise with the rest of you guys. So don't be surprised in a minute when I ask you for volunteers. Autistic people in general don't like surprises. They want things to be very, very predictable and well planned out. You guys now know that I'm gonna ask for volunteers so you understand what's gonna be happening next. Provide information ahead of time. <laughs> that sounds a heck of a lot like be prepared. If there are guidelines for tying knots, if there are maps of the hikes, if there are pictures of the campsites, I am an information hound. We went to summer camp and I had mapped out on Google Maps where everything possible at summer camp was. And that is good for all of us to be able to have that little information. 
break things into little steps, proceduralize things. Those of you who, have, uh, who are in the Boy Scouts and, and higher are familiar with the EDGE method. Explain, demonstrate, guide, enable. Breaking things into little steps makes it easier for us to succeed. And then alert parents of possible sensory problems. Sensory problems can be a very delicate subject. It can be something as much as the feel of a chair, the taste of a food, the sound of a jet flying over. If I'm taking my scouts to wings and things and I've got autistic scouts, I certainly want to talk not only to the parents, but also to the scouts about what it's like to be around loud airplanes when they're flying low and, and overhead and, and what that's going to be like and how exciting it is. Okay. I told you we were coming to the next part. I need seven brave volunteers. Now the symbol for scout for autism is colorful puzzle pieces. Colorful puzzle pieces. Are you going to be one of mine? Here you go. The other thing that is really funky about autism is that we like to take autistic scouts and label them. So I'm going to ask you to wear your puzzle piece. I'm not leaving you out of that. Around, not leaving you out of that. Around the neck. All right. Come on. Two more. Here we go. Two more. Here's what I'd like you to do. You're first on the end. Would you read what's on the back of your puzzle piece? Carl often seems like he's not paying attention. He constantly stares into space and doesn't make eye contact when people are giving him instructions. Later, it turns out he heard every word. The troop is going on a challenging camp out. Some of the leaders don't want to let Carl come because they notice he wasn't paying attention during the safety briefing. And it's called communications. This is a communications issue with autism. What are the things that we can do? Directly address the scout. One of the problems with autism is that they don't have the same social connections that we have. So I stand here and I talk to you and I look you in the eye and I talk to you. If you're looking off that way, I assume you're not listening. The fact that they're not looking you in the eye does not mean that they're not listening. Talk to them and say, hey, you know what? We talked about how to fasten that buckle before we go right climbing. Can you tell me how to do it? Pretend I'm a younger scout and tell me how you would do that. You will be surprised how much they capture. Yes, sir. At the last camp out, things went badly for Mel. After a long hike, he tried he tried opening his can his can for dinner. His can opener broke. Even though another scout came right over to help came right over to help him, he lo he lost it. He began screaming, running wildly, and throwing things. Parents were parents are concerned about letting their kid with Mel. Again, the meltdown. The meltdown the number one fear of autism. There were some keys to tell us that this meltdown was coming. Mel was tired. He'd been on a long hike. His can opener broke. Sometimes when you are tired and fatigued, the littlest things set us off. When you are tired, fatigued, overstimulated, and autistic, little things set you off in a way that is completely out of your control and embarrassing to the autistic scout who experience. What can we do as leaders to do that? We need to understand that he is becoming tired and overstimulated in a new environment. We need to give him breaks. Instead of bringing him right back to camp and moving him into, hey, we've got to get dinner going, it's dark here, give him a chance to come down. Maybe go sit in his tent by himself. Maybe sit by the fire. A way to be able to get back into the environment. I'm going to come right down the line to you. Peter likes things the same. When he goes camping, he wants, to, he wants things exactly the same as they were done last time. Other scouts get tired of always giving in to people <coughs> and want to try something different. Insistence on sameness and routine. So, Peter, as an autistic scout, always wants to do things the same way. Repetition is good for building things in, but it becomes boring for the other scouts. So what are the things that we do? We talk to Peter ahead of time about what we're going to be doing. Publish an agenda, but not a schedule. Because with an autistic scout, if you tell them at 9 o'clock we're going to have flag ceremony after breakfast, at 9.01, it's time for flag ceremony. It's time for flag ceremony. It's time for flag ceremony. If you tell them after breakfast we're going to have flag ceremony, then not until all the breakfast dishes are done are you ready to be able to do flag ceremony. All right. Go ahead. Saul is a lovable kid. He loves hugging, and he hugs everybody, even strangers. When he talks to people, he likes to touch them. He usually just puts his hands on their arms or on their face. But the other day, he reached out 
and touched the mom on her chest. He was surprised to get in trouble. And the mother is worried about yes, no. youth protection. Youth protection. Okay, I was going to make sure what that was. And it's social challenges. So with autistic kids who have social challenges, they may not understand the concept of personal space. If I'm talking to you and I get like this, this even subconsciously he moved away from me, but that just doesn't occur to them. So the fact that I'm talking to you and touching your arm or even your face or something, it's just what is mentally going on right now. It is important because we also have not only autistic scouts, we have scouts going through puberty. So they have social issues that they're dealing with at the same time that they are coming into their own maturity. And we have to work not only with the parents but with the scouts directly to make sure that we help them understand what's appropriate. Go ahead. Would you like to offer No. Okay, I, mean, go ahead. I, I mean, I wanted to say that I have actually um, have a form of autism, Asperger's, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Am I doing all right? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and everything completely about, um, you have it right on point that, because um, I work with kids with autism, and I've seen every form of this, so. Thank you. Tyler loves trains, all kinds of trains. He can name all kinds of rolling stock of engines. He has dozens of books on trains and knows things that that kid shouldn't even understand, which manufacturers use, use that suspension systems on the models. It is hard to get tired to focus on activities. Haven't helped to help it if he hears the train horns and in the distance. One thing that's really interesting about autistic kids is they will become experts on a particular field. Mr. Smith likes trains too, that's how I know the word rolling stock. And if there was an autistic kid who wanted to talk about rolling stock and the invention of the Pullman cars and braking systems, I would spend all day talking about that. However, if I want to get them to focus on how are we going to start a fire today, how are we going to tie a knot, how are we going to do a first date, are there things I can bring in from their interest? Can I tell the story of an old railroad man who got hurt on the railroad and needed to know first aid and let me show you what he needed to know because the log fell off the log car? It challenges us to be more creative, but you will find that those scouts who have dedicated interests will be able to go deeper into a topic than you ever imagined possible. Go ahead. Roger will sometimes repeatedly slap the back of his wrist with his other hand. It doesn't hurt, but it makes his arms turn red for a while. However, it, it makes a very destructive sound that makes it hard for the other scouts and leaders to focus on the task at hand. And it's repetitive motion stimming. It's called stimming or self-stimulation. And autistic people will tell you it's very calming. It helps them to focus. That may be an indication that your scout is paying attention to you, that they are trying to block out all of the other overstimulation so that they can pay attention to you. If I get a scout who's sitting in the corner tapping on his wrist like this, and I know that means he's paying attention, I want every scout in the room tapping on their <laughs> wrist so that they can pay attention. That wouldn't embarrass them. Well, it is embarrassing, but again, you have to make this program work with the scouts. And this is not just about how you work with the autistic scout. It's how you work with the regular leaders and the rest of the scouts, too. I was just about to ask you that. How do you do it when their mechanism that gets them on target is a mechanism that distracts the others. Well, I think, yeah, um, please, you're the expert here. Well, in, in some ways, you have to get other people, or even people that are regular, to go along with them. So as, like he said, if one person's, the autistic kid is going like that and going like that, that the, they probably have to take some time and observe him, and then as soon as he's done, maybe comfortable with it, then go back to the lesson, or whatever you're doing. Like, um, like he said that, um, some uh, autistic kids might be an expert on that, so you may have to divert or change your lesson into maybe what he's learning. So, kind of change your lesson or change your scout lesson to maybe incorporate what he's interested in. So that way he's going to learn better. Fantastic, thank you. <clears throat> One more puzzle piece. All right, Steve cannot eat anything with lumps in it. Oatmeal, mashed potatoes, even chili just makes him lose it. When it's time to plan meals, Steve is constantly reminding people that his food can't have any lumps in it. It is so annoying. Sensory challenges. Textures can set off autistic people like nobody else. I'm not autistic and do not give me a raw oyster. 
It can taste like the best thing in the world, but the texture of that will gag me every time. So what do you do about this? Let the scout participate in meal planning. If they don't like chili, you don't have to have chili. If everybody else in the troop wants to do chili, and this scout wants to do aluminum foil packets in the fire, it's an opportunity now for the autistic scout to show other scouts something they have said no. We've seen a lot of things here today, and when we put them together, we start to realize that in our picture for scouting, our picture for autism, scouting fits perfectly. And all the things that we've talked about today, stimming, meltdowns, sensory issues, communication issues, all of these things are prevalent in autistic kids. But they don't define any one of them. Every single one of them is individual. These things are autism, but these are not Sam. Because ladies and gentlemen, this is Sam. encounter autistic scouts in your units that you're able to be able to learn them the same way that I've come to know Sam. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. extremely important uh, issue for us, but that was probably the best presentation I've ever seen at a round table, so that's awesome. Yep. Bye bye! Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. Gene McCorgan is our uh, 